sex addiction and porn addiction can be a life threatening, severely debilitating addiction for some people. When I like, I started watching porn at a really young age. We had Andrew Huberman on. We kind of talked about this. I started at eleven. Yeah. I was finally able to break it at twenty four. But as I learned more and more about what it did to the brain, um, it, it start like like nowadays when I look back at it, when I was in it. Um, I didn't like everyone was saying, oh, it's not that big of a deal or whatever. But when I look back at it, I kind of I kind of look at it like, oh, that's kind of pathetic. Like mm. you're sitting in front of a computer screen in a dark room alone, watching people, <laughs> watching people do the thing you want to do. You know, like it, it's like I, it, it kind of brings me a, a level of disgust. But I wanted right. to talk about this just because um, when we talked about that with Andrew, a lot of men were in the comments. A lot of men have been DMing me. Um, that they have had those addictions to a lot of them started at 12, 13, 11, and they're yeah. finding it hard to quit, even though they know how it's affecting their lives negatively. And there's another sub subgroup of, of men who are like, Oh, it's not a problem at all. It's perfectly normal because societally it is somewhat normal to view porn consistently. Um, and I was curious, can you educate us? Cause a lot of people are like, Oh, there's no research to be shown that it's negative at all. It's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. What is it? Is it not a big deal? Is it something that, people can do safely without uh, without affecting them negatively? Is, is the novelty aspect of it not a big deal? Mm -hmm. OK, so the answer, the short answer is yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, the ways in which it, it really is a big deal is depends often on the person. There are some you know, again, this is this drug of choice concept. And I can tell you absolutely that sex addiction and porn addiction can be a life-threatening, severely debilitating addiction for some people, because I see those people in my practice and they come in and they are not functioning. They are not sleeping. They are not going to work. They are not accomplishing their life goals. They are in trouble with the law and they are contemplating suicide because of their pornography, sex addiction, compulsive masturbation. So this is, this is not just you know, oh, free to be you and me lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. This is this is serious. Having said that, that's probably maybe about 10% of the population. And then you've got a whole bunch of other people who can probably take it or leave it or use it as a recreational drug. And that's true for any drug, whether it's, you know, alcohol or <laughs> cannabis or nicotine <clears throat> or our smartphones. But, he, but here's the deal. Again, we all have our own separate lock and key. And for the person for whom pornography is their drug of choice, it can be a really serious addiction. I talk in my book, Dopamine Nation, I open with the case of a patient who had a very severe sex and compulsive masturbation addiction, which absolutely wreaked havoc on his life. That was a no joke pornography addiction. I talk about my own addiction to romance novels, which progressed over time to erotica, which is basically socially sanctioned pornography for women. And although I had a very mild version of it compared to you know, my patients, it was still real. It interfered with my ability to be the mother I wanted to be, to be the wife that I wanted to be, to be the doctor that I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, it's really important to note that what happens with pornography, as with any drug, is that over time, we need more and more to get the same effect, or we need more potent forms to get the same effect. And this is very true in pornography addiction. People will start out with kind of like, you know, average images, but over time, their fantasy life and the images will become, need to be more potent in order to get the same effect. And it can progress to a point where people are then, you know, consuming images that really are quite deviant and are inconsistent with their values and maybe even illegal. And now we're talking about seriously crossing a line, but this is the natural progression of any addiction. Again, that you need more potency. So I'll have patients come in and say, well, you know, do I have like a paraphilia or a sexual paraphilia? And I'll often say, it's not that, it's that you're addicted. You started out looking at this and now 10 years later, you're having to look at that because what you were looking at 10 years ago isn't going to work anymore. Mm. One more thing I want to add to this. When we're in our addiction and chasing dopamine, we do not see the, the damage often that it is doing unless it's super extreme. For me, it wasn't until I gave up romance novels and erotica for a month that I was able to get out of that compulsive vortex, look back and say, oh my God, that was really weird. <laughs> like, what my, my, I like my focus got so narrowed on that one type of pleasure, 
all these other things in my life that have been a source of pleasure for me were no longer enjoyable. Why? Because my pleasure pain balance had been usurped by this drug. And I was chronically tilted to the side of pain in a dopamine deficit state when I wasn't using. So of course, my husband no longer seemed interesting to me. My kids no longer seemed interesting to me. My profession no longer seemed interesting to me. But when I stopped and those gremlins got off and I was able to restore baseline dopamine levels, not only was I able to enjoy other things, but I looked back and I was like, wow, weird. This happens all the time in clinical care. People will get out of their addiction, it usually only takes about a month if they're able to abstain on their own and look back and feel a kind of surrealness at the person that they were Mm. and the amount of time and energy that they put into using their drug. So for the, your, you know, viewers out there who feel like it's no big deal, I'm not addicted. What I would suggest to them is the experiment that I suggest in my book, which is to stop using pornography or whatever their drug is for, for one month to know that in those first two weeks, they're going to experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal, anxiety, irritability, depression, craving to use. But if they can make it through a whole month without using, they can get to that place where they've restored homeostasis. Other things are enjoyable again. And most importantly to this question, look back and really say, wow, you know, that do I really want to use in that way? You know, that that's kind of strange. I really was over invested in that behavior. Hey, guys. You like cereal. I like cereal. Let's not eat the bad stuff, though. That's why we've partnered with Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon has, number one, amazing macros, zero grams of sugar, four grams of carbs, 14 grams of protein, and 140 calories per serving. You're not getting all the icky sugar that you get from normal cereal. Magic Mm -hmm. Spoon is the way to go. That's why we love it, and it fits our diet. Andrew, how can people get it? Absolutely. You guys got to head over to magicspoon.com slash powerproject. You guys will see the variety pack. That's four different flavors, and it's really an awesome way to kind of dip your toe into the cereal bowl, so that way you guys can figure out which flavor you like the most most. And when you go there, you're actually going to receive $5 off that variety pack. Again, magicspoon.com slash power project links to them down in the description. Let's get back to the video. Yeah. I've had way too many friends, uh, die from drug addictions and drug overdoses. Um, my own brother, my uncle, uh, my mother was even addicted to, uh, some prescription therapy or some prescription drugs and, uh, just a brutal thing to have, you know, kind of rip apart your family. I want to say that I think that you are the first person uh, we've done. I've done a few thousand podcasts and I think that you're the first professional that we've had on um, that has really laid something out like that to us about your own addiction and your own vulnerability. So I want to congratulate you on that because that is, that is some really powerful stuff and that just gives people a stronger connection to you. And I think it, it also um, helps people open their mind a little bit more to some of the information that you're sharing. Um, I do agree with Encima that a lot of times people think these things aren't a big deal, that they're addicted to this or addicted to that. I would also say that having my brother, Chris, who is still alive, um, be addicted to uh, drugs and alcohol, uh, he has mentioned to me some of the steps that he went through in recovery and some of the things he experienced. And a lot of the things he has shared with me, you know, getting up uh, in a room um, where, you know, everything's everything's supposed to stay in that room and that 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 type of thing. getting up and sharing these really emotional and powerful things amongst other people seems to be very freeing. And there was a lot of other things that he mentioned where I'm like, fuck man, I could use that. And I, I feel pretty good. (laughs) I feel pretty good about a lot of stuff, but man, it would be nice to get some of these things off my chest and to, uh, you know, like alcoholics anonymous, you're, you're, you're saying these things in confidence and one person after another is saying these really revealing things and my brother at first, he's like, I was getting super nervous as it was coming around the room to me, but he was like, I'm not as bad off as some of these guys. So <laughs> I'm going to let her, I'm going to let her rip. And he was able to kind of get some of those things out. Right, um, yeah. Do you think it's powerful to, for people to almost live their life as if they uh, are addicted or got trapped into some of that? I mean, it seems like some of the principles are really interesting and great ways to perhaps, um, live some of our lives. Oh, absolutely. So in my book, I hold up people with severe addiction and recovery as modern day prophets for the rest of us, because they've tapped into a universal wisdom Mm. that we could all benefit from. 
And one of the things that I've learned from my patients in recovery is the importance of radical honesty. And by that, I mean being honest, not just about using drugs, but also about every little thing in their lives. I remember I had a patient once who said to me, yeah, you know, when I was using, if I'd be at McDonald's and somebody called me, I'd say, yeah, man, I'm a Burger King. And then when I was at Burger King and they called me, yeah, man, I'm a, I'm a McDonald's. <laughs> And it was like, he said, I just lied about everything. It didn't even make any sense anymore. But that's what happens when we get in our addiction. We get into that lying habit. And of course, we're all natural liars. I think on average, we tell, you know, something like one to two lies a day. It's really hard to tell the truth, especially when we're telling the truth about little things that we feel like, oh, it doesn't really matter. You know, I'll just say I was late because of traffic when really I was late because I wanted five more minutes to read the paper. Um, but the truth is that there's a lot of benefit in being, as I, as I described in the book, radically honest. I learned this from my patients. I try to practice it in my life. I'm not always successful. But in trying to be honest about everything, large and small, it really does change us in so many important ways. And it changes our relationships with other people. One of the things that it does is it probably activates the prefrontal cortex. That's the big gray matter area right behind the forehead that's involved in delayed gratification, storytelling, executive function, planning. And because it's actively difficult to tell the truth, this actually stimulates the prefrontal cortex which in turn is really important for managing consumption. Because if you think about the prefrontal cortex up here, it's always communicating with our limbic brain, our emotion brain, what's sometimes called the lizard brain down below. And when that communication is happening, um, you know, we can manage our urges, our desires. But when we cut our prefrontal cortex off from those lower brainstem um, functions, then we're just our whole, we're, we're driven by impulse, by desire, by immediate gratification. So telling the truth actually, I think, activates these, these important brain structures. Hey, well, before you go, you got this far. That means that you've enjoyed the heat that we're continuing to bring you. So listen, listen, like the video, Comment something down below. We'll reply back and subscribe to the channel because we continue to bring you the heat. Seriously, do it. Love you. Bye.